Hello there. So this is video number one of section 4.5. Um, we're going to enter a new dimension. Uh, what we're actually doing is we're going to define what the dimension of a matrix is. Um, it just that the first intro sounds cooler. Uh, so what I want to do is prove yet sort of another generalization of uh, something that we've already seen to be true about vectors in Rn. Right, but now we're going to allow ourselves to expand to, to different vectors. Um, so remember we had a result about the vectors in Rn that stated that, um, well, basically stated that if I had more than n vectors of length n, right, so if maybe putting a number on this, if I had, say, four vectors all of length 3, that I know that those four vectors have to be linearly dependent. And so basically, we're going to generalize that result in this theorem. Um, and so what this theorem states is that I've, I've got a vector space V. And this vector space has a basis B containing n vectors. Then any set in V that contains more than this many vectors must be linearly dependent. And so you can kind of see how that mirrors the result that we had in Rn, because every basis of Rn is of size n. And so this is saying, well, if I've got more vectors than a basis would have, then this set has to be linearly dependent. And what this result will allow us to do afterwards is be able to show that if I have a vector space, every basis for that vector space has to have the same size. So for this first result, I've got sort of the proof uh, mapped out in the worksheet. I would highly recommend trying to work through those sort of problems uh, to, to get the proof. Um, and then uh, so you're pausing the video, working through those problems, and then I'll go over the proof here. All right, so welcome back. Um, so what we're going to do to prove this is we're going to take some set of vectors, u1 through up, in v, and we're going to assume that we actually have more than n vectors. All right, so we're going to assume that p here is bigger than n. Um, so this means if I look at the set of b coordinate representations of each of these vectors, so this would be u sub 1 b, u sub 2 b, all the way up through u sub pb, like that. Well, OK, so what is this set? This set here is a set of more than n vectors in Rn. Because remember, the coordinate representations of these vectors all live in Rn. So this means I've got more than n vectors of length n in Rn. So this set is linearly dependent. But notice that doesn't necessarily imply quite yet that the original set is linearly dependent. So we know that their coordinate representations are linearly dependent. We don't know about the original set quite yet. So how can we show that the original set is linearly dependent? And, and so interestingly, I, what I think is cool about this is we're proving a general result by actually working our way back to the sort of mirrored result in Rn that we already know. Uh, and so I, I actually really like that about this. All right, so second step. By the first step, um, we know, well, if these are a set of linearly dependent vectors in Rn, this means I can find a dependence relation Or maybe in other words, a set of scalars, c1 through cp, so that this sum is equal to the zero vector. All right, so why does that help me? Well, remember that the coordinate map <laughs> 
mapping each vector u to its coordinate representation in b is a linear transformation. So each one of these individual coordinate maps is a linear transformation that has been applied, and in fact, the same linear transformation that has been applied. And so this implies that I can use my properties of linear transformations to say that the left-hand side of this equation is actually equal to the B representation of the vectors had I added them before applying the coordinate map. So this here is applying the fact that the coordinate map is a linear transformation. So why is this important? Well, this implies, right, um, that, um, so notice this implies, since this is the zero vector of length n, that I can rewrite what's inside here. Right, so what is this telling me that this sum, well, I know it's B representation, right? So this sum is one vector, right? And I know the B representation of the vector that is this sum. It's just zero times each one of these basis vectors. Well, that's nice because it's a fairly easy vector to calculate. That's just the zero vector. So what have I got now? I've got that the sum of p vectors is equal to zero. But notice, since these vectors were linearly dependent, um, at least sum of these scalars, c1 through cp, were non-zero. So since this was linearly dependent, in this original dependence relation, some of these scalars were non-zero, but I'm using the same scalars here. So that means I've got the sum of p vectors using some non-zero scalars equal to zero, which proves the original result, that any set of more than n vectors in any vector space v with a basis of size n must be linearly dependent. So this is really nice because we now know that every basis in any vector space has to be of size n. And so that will be the next big theorem. And we won't go too deep into the proof of this because um, it sort of just follows directly from the theorem we just proved. Um, but I think ultimately in the long run, this theorem, which we'll say is theorem 10, is the theorem we'll probably reference a little more and so what this says is that if a vector space V has a basis of n vectors, then every basis of V as n vectors. All right, so notice this result basically just sort of follows directly from um, the previous theorem, because what you can do is you can look at um, two different bases and sort of say, well, okay, if, if one basis is bigger than the other, well, then the smaller one couldn't have been, a, either the smaller one couldn't have possibly been a basis, right, because their spans won't be equal. Or if the smaller one is a basis, then by the last theorem we showed that the larger set, which might have been a basis, is actually linearly dependent. And so you can sort of use that to say, okay, well, if I've got two sets which I think are bases, if the smaller one is a basis, the larger one can't be because it will be 
linearly dependent. If the larger one is a basis, then the smaller one can't be because its span couldn't possibly equal um, the same span as the larger one. So um, that's theorem 10. So what this implies is that with each vector space, we can associate a specific size basis, right? Because every basis has to be the same size in any vector space. And so this is what we call the dimension of a vector space. So we'll let V be a vector space. with a basis b1 through bn. Uh, so then we say that v is finite dimensional. Um, and this is because it has a basis of finite size. And there are infinite dimensional vector spaces, but I don't think we'll talk too much about them uh, here. Uh, and that the dimension of V uh, which will denote D I M of V is equal to N. So this is sort of the abbreviation for dimension of V. So when you're asked to find DIM of V, what that is asking for is just the size of any basis of V. And we know we can do this now from theorem 10. All right, so there's one specific sort of um, case that I want to go over. Um, it's one of those like, well, yeah, technically cases. Um, and that, actually, I'm not sure if we've talked too much about this vector space, but um, the zero vector space, or maybe you might call it the trivial vector space, which is literally just that um, we say has dimension zero. That is, there is no basis for this vector space in a sense. Um, so we kind of just set this to be equal to be true. Notice that the set containing just the zero vector is sort of trivially a vector space, right? Um, certainly it's a subset of Rn. So however, you know, or it's a subset of any other vector space that you put the zero vector in. Um, definitely closed under addition, right? The zero vector plus the zero vector is the zero vector. Um, <laughs> Right, the second quality of being a subspace is it contains the zero vector, and we've defined it to be the space that contains only that. And um, closed under scalar multiplication because anything times the zero vector is the zero vector. So this is sort of trivially a vector space or a subspace of a vector space if you prefer. And we just say it has dimension zero. Um, so just sort of keep that note in mind. I'm not sure if it'll ever pop up in the course, but it might. we might just sort of have to call on this having dimension zero, uh, it, it'll probably pop up in a proof or two later on. So I just want to end with a couple examples where we're going to you know, calculate some dimensions of vector spaces that we've seen before. And then we will move on to, well, then we'll move on to the next uh, video of this section. All right, so uh, with these examples, again, actually, I'd encourage you to um, think about these uh, a little bit before watching the solutions. Um, you know, they're, they're designed to be, well, so they'll be similar to, to homework problems and uh, quiz problems that you might get, but they're also sort of designed to, um, you know, to be a little challenging, but definitely doable. So I'd highly recommend, um, if you haven't done them, pausing the video here and working through them. Um, I won't do any more awkward pauses where, um, yeah, it's like, I, I don't know why I keep thinking I need to, like, I'll say pause the video and then, um, but of course, you know, you could just pause the video anywhere. Um, anyways, so the first one says, given that we know this is a basis for, um, 
the polynomials with degree at most two. Uh, what is the dimension? Of P2. And then it says for all n, find a basis um, for P sub n. And then I'll talk about the last part of this question after we do these two things. So, how do we do this? Well, Notice here, the first part to this question is sort of just applying the definition of dimension, right? So here we've got a basis for P2 that's of size three. So we would say the dimension of P2 is equal to three. So be really careful with that. Um, this often will confuse me a little bit. The dimension of the polynomials of degree at most two is equal to three. So the dimension of, well, and so now we can look at, getting a little bit ahead of myself, So the following set, then, would be a basis for P sub n. And so this means that the dimension of P sub n is equal to n plus 1. So um, notice here that this is sort of the general result I almost got to in part one, that the dimension of the polynomials of degree at most n is n plus one. And that's because whenever we're talking about the polynomials of degree at most n, we also sort of have to tack on that degree zero term. So this means, right, since we can associate each vector with its coordinate matrix in Rn, so by associating, so if we let this be B, each polynomial with the coordinate representation of that polynomial under this basis B, which we've chosen, we can see that P sub n is isomorphic to R n plus 1. So if I take the set of polynomials of degree at most n, that vector space as a vector space is always going to be isomorphic to um, just the standard vector space R n plus 1. So the set of polynomials of degree at most 3 would be isomorphic to the vector space um, R4. Uh, notice here too, actually I should point out n should be greater than or equal to one. Um, oh no, actually n could be greater than or equal to zero, right? Because right, if I'm taking the polynomials of degree um, equal to zero, right? That would just be isomorphic to R1, which is just R. And then in fact, they would actually be the exact same space. So kind of cool. All right, so number two. Uh, this is one of those where they sort of define a space with like one vector and multiple variables. Um, I think throughout this chapter we've seen a couple of these. So it gives us the following set, uh, which I'll call S. Oh no, my marker is running out a little bit. And so it gives us these two variables. And so we want to find the dimension of the subspace spanned by the solving set of vectors, uh, which this is basically just asking us to find the dimension of S. So certainly you could show that this vector space was in fact a subspace of R3, uh, right? It's closed under addition because you can sort of just use the associative or commutative associative. I can never remember the names of them. Definitely closed under addition. If I let s and t equal zeros, I'm good. And notice I could factor in and out a scalar to always rewrite the vector as 
in that following form. So no qualms about this being a vector space. Uh, so much like we did before, we want to separate the variables. So if, say, vector s is in x, no, nope, vector x is in s, excuse me, then we know that x is equal to 4, negative 3, 0, times s, plus 0, 0, negative 1, times t. And so we could actually show that s is equal to the span right, of these two vectors. Well, and so this immediately checks off condition one of this set being a basis, right? Because s is equal to the span of this set. The only thing we need to double check is that this set is linearly independent, which as you can see here, since uh, the third coordinate, I've got a zero in one and a one in the other, it's definitely linearly independent. Um, and you can always check that, right? Like if you've got two vectors, especially three vectors, it starts to get a little harder. Um, I guess with two vectors, we could also just say like they're clearly not scalar multiples of each other. And so this means that the dimension of s is equal to 2. And again, all we need to do to check this is find one basis for s, argue that it's a basis, and that allows us to find the dimension. So uh, we'll continue to talk about this um, next video, uh, talk about some more things that we can study, uh, specifically the dimension of subspaces. And then video three of this section, I'm actually combining with the next section um, because they kind of talk about this, like it, it just ends up being a nice transition and the next section isn't super long. And we'll talk about uh, how the dimensions of the column space and null space of a matrix are related.